15 años y medio millón de muertos después de la invasión estadounidense, Irak se desangra en una guerra casi permanente. La última gran batalla ha dejado así la ciudad de Mosul, la segunda más importante del país, y nada indica que la expulsión del autodenominado Estado Islámico signifique en absoluto el final de la violencia. Le preguntamos a Robert Fisk, uno de los mayores especialistas en Oriente Medio, después de cuatro décadas trabajando como reportero sobre el terreno. ¿Hasta qué punto todo este desastre es consecuencia de la invasión estadounidense? I think it's pretty much 100% a consequence. I mean, if Saddam had stayed alive and there had been no invasion and maybe his sons, maybe Uday would have taken over or maybe there would have been an Arab revolution in Iraq. Um, it couldn't look like it does now if the Americans had not illegally invaded in 2003. I mean, um, you know, there are still American politicians who try to say, oh, in the long run it was a good thing. It wasn't. There's no proof of that at all. You know, half a million people, it's estimated, died. I saw people killed in Iraq. I saw people lying dead on the streets. It didn't happen before 2003. Odious though Saddam, horrible though Saddam was, um, what set off this orgy of killing and massacres was the Anglo-American invasion, which was illegal. You know, people keep saying, rightly, that, um, you know, for a half million dead, Assad should be put before a war crimes trial in Syria, for Syria. Well, Bush and Blair killed half a million people, shouldn't they be? also before a war crimes trial. Um, long before the Americans came to Iraq, there were clear signs, clear signs, that there would be a resistance. Osama bin Laden called for a resistance himself in a broadcast, and the CIA spent their time saying, oh, is this really bin Laden or a fake? They didn't listen to what he said. And from that invasion came ISIS, which moved into Syria and then moved into other countries, including European countries. Um, Baghdad is um, Baghdad is really a um, shambolic metaphor for what the West does in the Middle East, um, which is we come. We offer democracy, we bring our tanks and we destroy. Um, you know, there is, we've got to stop coming to the Middle East and offering them freedoms and all kinds of presents and gifts and then destroying their country and killing their people. But we still go on doing it. We did it in Afghanistan, we did it in Iraq. We're even threatening to bring about democracy in Syria. Heaven spare us, please stop, you know. And every time we offer democracy, and the people there have never asked for it, they've asked for dignity, and they've asked for justice, which is not the same as democracy. We arrive promising democracy, and we arrive with our tanks, our helicopters, our snipers, our marines, our um, parachute regiments and parachute divisions. We never arrive with our school teachers or our geologists or our university graduates, which might be more use. ¿Qué importancia tuvo el control del petróleo en la decisión de invadir Irak? People say, oh no, it's not economic, they were not interested in the oil. It's rubbish. If the total gross national product of Iraq was potatoes or paper clips, the 92nd Airborne would not have gone to Mosul. It's an oil country. And when they went there with the British, they proved immediately that they didn't, they weren't interested in Iraqis. You know, I remember a conversation I had with a CIA officer holding a huge gun on a Spanish military base before you left uh, Iraq. And he said, you know, what's gone wrong, Bob? <laughs> you see, I said, well, You might have taken a page from the Roman Empire. I wasn't recommending crucifixion. 
Um, but I said, you know, when the Romans conquered a foreign country, they gave them citizenship of Rome. I don't think all the Iraqis would have rushed off and gone to JFK Airport in New York, but they would have said, well, you really do love us after all. You're not just after the oil. And I said, but you didn't do that, did you? You wanted the oil and you didn't care about the Iraqis. And that is the truth. And if you invade someone's country and offer them democracy and you don't care about them, they're going to try and kill you. And they did. It's the only key. You see, you've got to realize that every Arab country has oil or water. But only one Arab country has oil and water, and that's Iraq. So it was, forget Saddam and the nature of the regime, it was a symbolic paradise in the Arab world. It had oil and it had water. And the Americans came and they said, we want to free you. Forget it. It sectarianized them. The first thing the, the Americans did when they got to Baghdad was to say, well, we've worked out the percentage of Christians, the percentage of Shiites, the percentage of Sunnis. This is what the French did in Lebanon in 1920. It's what the British did in Cyprus and Northern Ireland. And we're then going to say, this is the Americans, well, the Shiites are the majority, so they'll have more than 50% of the votes. What is this nonsense? They didn't treat Iraqi society, which is culturally, uh, economically, extremely mature, as a real people. They treated them as children, which is a symbol of colonial rule. And they said, oh, well, you know, we'll decide what you want, and the Shiites will rule Iraq. Inevitably, the Sunnis were going to say no and boycott the election, and the Sunnis were going to lead the resistance. And that became Al-Qaeda. You know, you could say at the time, well, we're not sure, we don't know, but you can't deny it now. And Al-Qaeda became part of Nusra, Daesh, ISIS, and then it blossomed in Mosul, Raqqa, part of Aleppo, and it began to contaminate the Middle East. That was what we did. It was an injection into the bloodstream of the Arab world, the American invasion. And the reaction, the medical reaction by the Arabs to that poisonous injection was war. And the Americans got war. Todo esto parece un desastre político, un desastre militar y un desastre económico. ¿Es de verdad un desastre o fue otra cosa? Look, the Americans had no sense of perspective. They didn't study Iraq. In the Second World War, when the British were still expecting a German invasion of, in 1941, before Hitler invaded Russia, Churchill appointed a cabinet committee in London to learn how to rule German cities under British occupation. He decided he would win the war and rule Germany. This is 1941. The Americans didn't know what they were going to do in Iraq the day they crossed the bridge over the Tigris River. They didn't plan. You know, I said to one American officer, why don't you open a tented hospital and say, come all your poor masses, as America always invited the poor of Europe to come to America, and invite every Iraqi to come, whether they've had, you know, a torn fingernail or cancer or sickness. They hadn't thought of it. Um, if you treat a people as if they're dirt, you'll get treated like that. It was, it, it, you know, when we talk about it as a tragedy, we're doing the Americans a favor. It was not a tragedy. It was a military, political, economic, moral disaster. And the Iraqis did not deserve that. They'd been through the Iran-Iraq war from eight years, 1980 to 88. They'd been through the war over Kuwait, another Saddam project that failed. And now they were treated like this by the Americans, and the Americans thought they would be loved for it. Excuse me. También Afganistán está al borde del colapso por la violencia después de la invasión liderada por los Estados Unidos. Los objetivos de la ocupación militar eran tres. 
destruir Al Qaeda, expulsar a los talibanes y exportar allí la democracia. Ninguno de ellos se ha cumplido. Los talibanes están recuperando terreno en Afganistán, ya controlan prácticamente el 60% del país. ¿Por qué está ocurriendo esto? Because the Americans they first of all came to Afghanistan, they said we're going to give you democracy. Here we go again. And then when it was obvious to them that bribery and corruption ruled Afghanistan, they said, well, it cannot be Jeffersonian democracy. It won't be perfect. And they poured money into Kabul, Kandahar, Jalalabad. And every militia who would protect the Americans, take the side of the Americans, you know, the president's brother. He had to have villas, a convoy of cars, armed guards. And what the Americans created was Mafiastan, not democracy. They replaced Afghanistan with Mafiastan, which is now spreading into Tajikistan and other stans. And from the start, it went wrong. For example, I found villages there where NGOs had come with the Americans. And they'd go into a village and say, listen, if you tell us information about the Taliban, we will build a well here to provide water for your people. And the people thought, hmm, there are too many strings attached to this. And when real NGOs came without the Americans, the villagers said, you're the occupation force. The Taliban said, even after the Americans were driving them physically into Pakistan, uh, into the um, southern, northern areas of Pakistan, the Taliban said to me, but we never asked for land. We were there to preach and talk about God. Unfortunately for the people of Afghanistan, who didn't need to be preached to, and so their return was natural. The gun and the Koran ruled. The Americans did not offer huge educational establishment, humanist education. I don't think America could, but they might have found other people who could in other Muslim countries. But they didn't do that. They audited their accounts. They paid off everybody. And in the end, Afghanistan today is worse than it was under the original Taliban. Um, you don't get the huge massacres that you had at Mazar-e-Sharif, but it's a fearful place to go to. You know, bombs in Kabul now are just a heartbeat. You wouldn't imagine that would ever happen. And the suicide bomber, the suicide bomber arrived from Iraq. You could never imagine the Afghans blowing themselves up before. You couldn't imagine the Iraqis. I mean, it started in Lebanon, it went to the Palestinians, it carried on to Iraq, and then it popped up in Afghanistan like, a, like an infection of people who wanted to be martyrs for Islam. And the Americans called them terrorists. Of course they called them terrorists. Goodbye, the Americans. That was the end. People are always telling you that Afghanistan or Iraq or Lebanon is in the greatest crisis since the last greatest crisis. Um, look, I think Afghanistan has to be seen as what it is. If you fly over Afghanistan and you look down on those deep valleys and those precipitous mountains, no army should ever go there. It is unrulable except by Afghan tribes. After all, they live there. It's their country. It belongs to them, not to us. And the Americans thought that Western ideas military technology could overcome this? You see, what happened in Afghanistan and in Iraq was that the Americans were at the height of their empire. I suppose George W. Bush. It's not at the height of their empire now, but it was then. And empires prove their power not by being wealthy, but by spreading their empire. That's what the British did, that's what the Romans did. We can go to Samara 
in southern Iraq where civilization began. So the US Marines will go there. We can go to Baghdad. So we can. Then if we can go to Mosul, we will send the airborne troops. And I remember one day south of Baghdad on Highway 18, I think it was, watching this massive convoy. The, the Americans were rotating their troops. And this massive convoy, tens of thousands of trucks, men, helicopters. And I thought, this is an expression of imperial power. If the Romans wanted to intimidate you, they marched two legions through your cities. And at the end of it, you did not object. And all empires are the same. If the British were massacred in India or wherever, um, they took military revenge against civilians. When the Romans were attacked in the Roman ages in southern, what is now southern Turkey, they destroyed people by the tens of thousands. They didn't suffer any bin Ladens. Empires, by their nature, are very cruel. They're not kind. And the saddest thing is when you see people in Afghanistan or Iraq or Palestine saying, but they promised to help us. Forget the promises. It's not true. Uh, I remember south of Kandahar one day going to a village where NATO troops had staged a raid. They'd killed a little girl and a man had jumped down a well and died. And uh, the village leaders were giving me bits of the ammunition to prove that the Americans and other troops were there. And they said that they were prepared to trust the occupying force a little bit longer. They probably had made a mistake. And they said, did they make a mistake? To me. And I said, I wouldn't trust them if I were you. I wouldn't trust me, is what I was saying. You know, if they send you doctors and they send you bridge builders, if they send you academic, university scholars, historians, be kind to them. They're coming to your home as a friend, but not soldiers. That's what I told this, these village leadership. I, I told them that because it was the truth. Look, for empires, Afghanistan is this romantic, mythological boundary line. Most countries have frontiers on rivers or hills or the Apennines or the Jura, or wherever. But Afghanistan is so rough and high and snowbound that it's the frontier of the world. So you've got to go there. It's psychological. And it didn't need the Taliban. Eventually the Americans would turn up, you know. And in fact, remember that they'd already had the Russians, and one of the heroes who was fighting the Russians was a man called Osama bin Laden. And when I interviewed him in Afghanistan, he was proud of having, as he put it, um, destroyed the Russian army, which was pushing it a bit, but you know, that's what he said. And he said, and I pray to God that um, he allows us to turn America into a shadow of itself. That, those were his words. And he pretty much did. When I, I was crossing the Atlantic on a French aircraft when... Nine, on 9-11 and I got back to Brussels actually <laughs> transferred and there were the you know twin towers and I, all the smoke and the dust I thought well Manhattan is a shadow of itself um, and here was a man who had in his mind genuinely fought for God's people in Afghanistan um, maybe he had um, but we put Bin Laden there. The last and third interview I had with him was in a series of cave complexes built by the CIA. <laughs> Excuse me. What did you think he was going to do? Put his hand in his heart and sing dum da dum 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 dum. He wasn't going to do that, was he? When you play with people in this dangerous part of the world, to survive you've got to be a chemist in nitroglycerin. Fuimos a Afganistán, o eso nos dijeron, a matar a Bin Laden. Bin Laden ya está muerto. ¿Qué seguimos haciendo en Afganistán? If they wanted Bin Laden, they should have put him before a court. 
International Criminal Court. Um, but in fact, they chose to assassinate him, which is what bin Laden would like to do to them. Well, he did for 3,000 people on 9-11. Um, look, I don't think... You see, the problem with the West, not just America, but the West, Europe as well, is that we, we think we understand the history of the Middle East. We tell Middle Eastern people their history as if they don't know it. They know it better than we do. It's their land, you know. And we, we take this extraordinary arrogance that we will decide uh, the peace of Afghanistan. We will kill the resistance in um, Iraq. We will destroy Bashar al-Assad. We will decide the peace process for the Palestinians. Yeah. Poor old Palestinians. Um, and with the accession of Trump, it's all become a farce. Who would think that American power in the Middle East would end up as high comedy or low comedy? We thought it might end in a fireball, but it's end up as a television comedy. Quite extraordinary. Quite extraordinary. I mean, I live in Beirut. I've lived there for what, almost 42 years now. And, um, you know, almost all my friends are Arabs. And they say to me, don't you realize what you're like? They don't mean me. They mean the countries I come from the, as a Westerner. And I said, alas, I do, but I live here, don't I? You know? Um, it's a great tragedy because it didn't have to be like that. You know, America is capable of great good in the world and great good in the Middle East. But it's not um, a desire to do good that um, animates the United States or Europe. Otra de las grandes heridas abiertas en Oriente Medio es Palestina. Israel ha impuesto aquí un régimen de apartheid con la complicidad de los Estados Unidos y el silencio de eso que llamamos comunidad internacional. Muros, asentamientos ilegales y castigos colectivos hacen cada día más difícil la resolución del conflicto. ¿Es viable todavía la solución de los dos estados? The two state solution was the only solution that might have worked. I remember after Oslo when I think a majority of Palestinians I knew were prepared to accept it. With some swapping of land, with mutual declarations of love, with economic help, with millions of dollars of American money, maybe. But now I don't think that's possible because the Israelis have no intention of permitting a Palestinian state to exist in dignity, which means borders, a military defense and I think the greatest danger is to the Israelis because they're going to have an apartheid state forget the one state solution this is just dreamy rubbish from um, you know um, liberals another danger to the Middle East but um, I think Israel's already probably lost the chance its government is I mean, you, you have to go further than saying it's right wing. It is stealing land daily from Palestinian Arabs who own that land. The American ambassador supports the theft of that land from Arabs. He's for the settlements. They're not settlements, they're colonies. This is the last colonial war in uh, the Middle East, in the world. It's the last colonial war. And remember, the American peace process was never a process. All it was was the Americans supporting a moderate Israeli government. A moderate has to go in quotes. Now they've given their full support to a right-wing, more than right-wing Israeli government that says thank you very much to the American president for giving them Jerusalem as a capital. Um, this is a, um, a volcanic shift in Arab politics. Um, the Al-Aqsa is not going to be in the eyes of Muslims in the capital of Israel. Um, there were chances. Jerusalem, a shared city, agreed borders for a Palestinian state, or maybe Jerusalem divided but shared between the two peoples so there were no border walls. But that's long gone. It's a great pity because it's the politics of 
revanchism, the politics of take all that has destroyed this. In many ways, it's also um, the politics of the Arab world, of the dictators who say, I own this country. Look at Mubarak. He thought he owned Egypt. Or Field Marshal President Sisi. Or Assad. Or the present, you know, um, Prime Minister of Israel. I think the Middle East has lived through a great tragedy and I don't see any sign of it finishing. Thank you.